and we're on live. Hey everybody, it's me, Jewel Jordan, Executive Director of Brown, Virginia, and we are here today to talk all things General Assembly 101. We are taking it to the basics. I want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's very important for us, I think, as we go into the new session of the General Assembly for 2021, that we have an understanding of what's happening there. So therefore, we can have a viable impact on what our elected officials are doing. Joining us today, we have some wonderful panelists. And I'm going to go ahead and give a brief introduction. I'm going to ask them to go ahead, too, once you all get to talking to uh, go more into detail. But first up, we have Mallory No Payne, a journalist here in Richmond. She is a Twitter favorite to us because she is real. She is not biased. And she has a great um, presentation for us today. She covers the General Assembly, but she also covers not just the legislators, but she covers the advocates that are out there and the citizens that come around. We have Melina Llanos, who is the chief of staff of Senator Demet Pike. I am so proud to also call her a friend. She is the first Latinx uh, chief of staff in the General Assembly. So she is, we have history. We have a history maker today. We also have Valerie Slater, the executive director for Rise for Youth. Rise for Youth, and she can go into way more details uh, is a great organization that uh, supports and advocates for um, juvenile justice reform, especially here in Virginia. And coming to us, you don't see him yet, but I am going to say, going to say him. We have the founder of Brown Virginia that's online helping us out backstage, Jasper Hendrick. Okay, so um, I say we go ahead and get started, Mallory, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm just gonna roll into things. Um, hey y'all, I'm so, so pleased to be here today. I'm a reporter and I cover uh, Virginia state politics and policy and I've been doing that for about five years. Can y'all, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and I'm gonna do a sort of civics 101, like a basic breakdown of um, how Virginia's legislative process works. What is General Assembly? What are we gonna be talking about today? Um, so first and foremost, General Assembly, it's Virginia's Congress. It's the legislative body of the state. So that's the most basic important <laughs> piece of information to understand is that what we're talking about is Congress lawmakers, but for Virginia, and that's the General Assembly. Just like in Congress, it's split up into two separate bodies. So Virginia has a state Senate and a House of Delegates. The House of Delegates has 100 people in it, and the state Senate has 40 people in it. So you have two representatives in Virginia's um, General Assembly. You've got two folks who represent you, based on where you live in the state. Um, who's in control? Democrats. Um, this is a relatively new thing in Virginia, but Democrats control both the state Senate and the House of Delegates. Um, and that uh, happened in 2018. So like I said, really recently. Um, Virginia, uh, I wanna say that so, the Senate is um, 21 Democrats, 19 Republicans, so a sort of small margin there. And then the House of Delegates is 55 Democrats and 45 Republicans, so a little bit of a larger majority there. And then um, our governor is also a Democrat, so we've sort of got a bit of a blue sweep here in Virginia. Like I said, relatively new, so depending on where you are on the spectrum, it opened up all sorts of new advocacy possibilities when Democrats took control. Um, here's the other thing that's really important to understand is that Virginia has a part-time legislature. The folks doing this work um, aren't there all year round and many of them have other jobs. Um, teachers, social workers, lawyers, doctors, um, these are folks who kind of do this on the side, um, and it's a really big job. 
um, Virginia's lawmakers come to Richmond um, one time, well, one big time a year for the legislative session. It's not happening all year long. Um, it happens for this like chunk of time, um, either a month or a couple of months each year. And so it's like all of this lawmaking is like crammed into this very tiny period of time. And that's really important for you guys to know and understand as advocates because it kind of influences when is the best time to get in touch with your lawmakers and um, when should you be communicating with them. And I'm sure we're all going to talk about that more, but um, that's called the legislative session. And so Virginia's session um, happens in the winter every year in um, February or March. And um, we go on off years. So um, every other year, it's half the length of the following year. Okay, that's sort of the basics of who is the General Assembly and when do they meet? Um, now, what do they do? <laughs> um, their biggest job is the state budget. Um, we're talking like a set, they're, they're deciding how Virginia spends about $70 billion do taxpayer dollars a year. And we're talking how much teachers get paid, how many guidance counselors are in your kids' schools, who's eligible for Medicaid, um, how many people work in the unemployment office that's going through all those claims right now. Um, these are the things that are in the state budget. The state runs police, education, courts, prisons, roads. They're the, they're the legislative body that it's where the rubber meets the road of lawmaking. It's the laws that impact people's daily lives the most. Um, Congress is big and Congress is important and Congress has a lot of power and a lot of money, but state houses is where the rubber meets the road. Um, and that's awesome because they are so much more accessible to you than a congressperson is. Um, they're in your own backyard and they represent so many fewer people. So it's easier for you to have, um, to get in touch and to say what you think. Um, when I first started covering uh the general assembly and state politics five years ago i started going to this building where they meet in downtown richmond um every day during session and watching committee meetings and seeing hearings and listening to lawmakers talk and interviewing them and one of the first most important things i kind of noticed and learned um and maybe this should be obvious to anyone who's ever worked in any workplace um but there are some people who are really good at this job and some people who are not as good at this job. <laughs> um, and that doesn't always fall along party lines. Um, so there are some lawmakers who are more effective than other lawmakers. Um, there are some lawmakers who are easier to talk to and whose offices are easier to get in touch with and are more responsive and they understand the process better. Um, you know, you sit in these committee meetings and you listen to them talk and you're like, oh yeah, you get it. And sometimes you're like, oh yeah, you don't get it. And and that's part of it, right? That's that's part of how it goes. It's 140 people from across the state. Um, some of them are, are gonna be better at this job than others. Um, and I think that's an important thing to kind of remember too. And it was one of my, it was one of the first things I really noticed that smacked me when I was covering session. Um, um, some of them are, are going to be better at this job than others. Um, so I'm hearing myself right then. <laughs> um, and then the last thing that I want to say that I think is so important and is a little bit of a source of um, optimism or hope when we look at state houses they have so much power the decisions they make have such an impact on our everyday lives and um, they're more accessible but not only that they're more representative 
Um, 89% of elected office holders nationwide are white folks. Um, we're talking Congress, city councils, sheriffs, 89%. Um, there's one place where um, representation comes close to parity. It doesn't, it, it's not representative. We're not there yet, but out of all the legislative bodies, state houses come the closest to accurately reflecting the people that they represent, the demographics of their constituents. Um, and so I, I think that that is a good thing to remember as well when we think about Virginia's um, state house. So they're more accessible to you. Um, they're more likely to reflect you. Um, but the downside is that they only meet during that short chunk of time. And so they can be tough to get a hold of. They can be tough to influence if you don't understand the system or how best to reach out or when to reach out. So I'm hoping, I think that's what we're gonna like talk more about today. Um, that's it for me right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was perfect. Um, I think like when I first started here, it was overwhelming. I still to this day will see an article and it says delegate so-and-so and I don't know who or that this delegate ever existed in life. And they've been serving like it's so many people on so many faces. And so we are going to go to Malina next because she it was one of those faces that you would see. Also, I think, I don't know if we did a disclaimer of, we're gonna discuss the G GA, General Assembly, GA, that we know now because in 2021, due to the uh, coronavirus, it will not be the same. <laughs> as far as lobbying, as far as activists, as far as being able to just snatch, it. everyone talks about just going into the Pocahontas building, and which is their office um, here in Richmond, and just grabbing somebody before they get on the elevator, before they go to the bathroom to get a chance to talk. We're gonna to have to start planning out virtual appointments like this. And that means that sometimes somebody can be busy and you never will get a chance to talk to them because they're so busy. No, I mean, so, Melina, can you talk, you know what I would really like to ask, how did you get started? How did you even know there was a thing called chief of staff to like apply to? How did you get here? Um, so I guess to start, I, in 2017, I, um, got kind of like a random internship, um, uh, not a random one, but, uh, with League of Conservation Voters, um, I was at VCU, um, and I was an environmental studies major. And so that was kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, I pay attention to politics in my free time type thing. And um, I care about the environment. So it was a good kind of shift into getting more involved, especially um, on the state level. Um, so I took that internship and then it was in the fall. So we, towards the last month of it, kind of shifted all of our resources and we're working on um, now Governor Northam's campaign, um, just starting with knocking doors, like complete volunteer stuff. Um, and so through that, I met, um just in talking with people. Oh sorry. Um I met somebody who was um she worked for the Virginia Senate Democratic Caucus. Her name is Christina Hagen. She recently left, um, but she is the reason that I do any of this. I sent her my resume, just you know, we had been friendly and she was like, let me know if you ever need anything, future internships, whatever. So I emailed it to her and she um, connected me with now Congresswoman Wexton's office. Um, so I did an internship and kind of really, you just kind of get pushed off a cliff. Um, sometimes in internships, if you don't know what's going on in the state level, I really had not too much. I knew like very little, I had you know seen the names and every year is a campaign year in Virginia. So it's like, you kind of see the names and but you kind of don't really know what election is happening. Um, if you're like just growing up, I obviously know now. Um, 
but I worked for Senator Wexton for um, a session and then I kind of just, it was like addicting to me and I was like, oh my God, I have to like, I can't get enough of this. Um, so the following, like this um, spring 2019, winter, spring 2019, um, I did an internship with Delegate Tran, Delegate Kathy Tran from um, Virginia's 42nd district. I had to say it so many times, but now it's kind of getting all the numbers are mixing up in my head. Um, but I did an internship with her, a fellowship with her, kind of a step up, had a little bit more responsibility. Um, and then fast forward to this past December, 2019, um, I reached out to the person I had reached out to originally, Christina, um, and sent her my resume and just was like, hey, you know, I'm kind of looking for a more like an actual paid position. Um, and so she blasted my resume out to offices she knew were hiring um, for aid positions. So kind of a step, the secondary person um, in the office staff. Um, and so I got a call from Senator McPike's office, his chief of staff at the time. Um, and I did an interview with him like in two days. Um, I remember I was in Richmond and I drove up to Alexandria to meet him um, to do like a lunch interview. And I was like, oh my God, I don't really know if I'm prepared for this. Um, and it was just such a good, like once we met, it was really easy going. It was really easy to talk to him. We had like a good professional flow, I guess. Um, and then this summer, I mean, this session, this, first session back in January through March, I kind of just, I don't know if I worked my butt off. Um, and he really saw that and especially changing to virtual um, telework, he kind of saw that I was just really stepping my game up and offered me a promotion. Um, so in June, I'm getting all my months mixed up because 2020 just seems like it's been 15 years. Um, but in June, I got promoted to chief of staff from legislative aid. Um, so that's where I am today. That was just kind of a brief overview of how that happened. Yes, well, congratulations. Thank so you. Just, just that, that's very, very, so proud of you. Real quick for the folks watching, they need to talk to their delegate or they need to talk to their senator. How's the best way? Because you're the person that they go through first, correct? Yeah. So we are like the district email. Um, so the best way to contact, um, I always appreciate email just because it's easier for me. I've caught, I'm someone who like tech, checks my texts or checks my phone calls and I think like, oh, I'll, I'll call back later and just for, you know, whether it's you're driving something you forget. Um, for me, for our office, it's easiest in an email. Um, you'll just email your district office um, with your name, your address. Um, so, you know, especially right now when we're on kind of limited time with virtual meetings, uh, making sure that they're taking, a, that taking care of their constituents first mm -hmm. and folks who live in their district. Um, so your name, address, what you want to talk about. Um, you could even just be, you know, I'm concerned about like just be as specific as possible. But if you're kind of like, I just want to talk about criminal justice. Um, you don't have to be come with a bill number if you don't know it. You just can be like, I want to talk about criminal justice and marijuana legalization or criminal justice and the school to prison pipeline. Um, just bring your passion and make sure that you give them ahead of time. So, you know, we can prepare. Um, oh, you know, oh, this is that's great that they want to talk about this. We've got this bill, this bill, this bill. Um, you know, we know this person in the community if they want to get more involved in volunteering for something. Um, and even sometimes it's so specific that, you know, some people email us about, you know, I want a red light here, or I want a stop sign, or I want to talk about traffic patterns, kind of more like the nitty gritty, um, not super fun, sexy kind of stuff, but that's still like incredibly important. Um, and that's, we can be like, oh, that's perfect. That's actually something we can connect you with your county supervisor, or we can connect you with your city council person, or, oh, this is something that we can act as a liaison for our office to a state agency. Um, right now that's happening a lot with unemployment and trying to help folks get, you know, get a hold of 
where is my, I filed a claim, I need to know where it's going. Um, and that's kind of like the, I would say like a really big majority of things happen, um, but you're talking about meetings. Um, so just make sure you get your name, address, um, information that's relevant to what you wanna talk about. Um, and I really appreciate when people bring specific dates and times and not just, can we just talk? Cause I'm like, right. what, like, okay, but I'm not, if I give you a random day and a random time and it doesn't fit for you, like try and narrow down. Um, and I say for session, definitely have um, maybe like two or three times that you can offer because as aides, that's beautiful for us to be like, oh, we can't, you know, if you only give us 930 and we already have something, we don't have to constantly go back and forth in an email chain of how about 10 o'clock, how about 1015? Um, and normally um, for constituents, we do like 20 to 30 minute meetings. Some people will straight up be like, I only want to do 10 minutes. Um, and some people really want to bring, you know, whatever it's called. <laughs> I don't know, bring like lots of supplies with them. Right. Um, but I would say just, yeah, emailing is also helps because then you've got like a thing to go back on and not just, mm -hmm. oh, well, they said on the phone this. Um, and then I know for our office, it's been incredibly busy. Um, so like it takes me a few days and I like on that email, like we use Gmail, so it kind of nudges you and it's like, Hey, you haven't received, like, you haven't replied to this in three days. Oh. I can go, Oh my gosh, wait. Yes. And then, you know, for me, I prefer email. Right. It's a really long answer. <laughs> No, that's good. I also want to jump back real, real quick. Also, everyone say hello to Aja. Aja Moore. Aja, I'm going to let you introduce yourself once we get to you. <laughs> get um, but Aja also works in the uh, office of Senator Louise Lucas and now is currently the policy assistant for Governor Ralph Northam. Mm -hmm. uh, for Melina, I like that you brought up that people will call your office and it's just something that you don't do. They're going to call and say, hey, I have a pothole. Well, we're sorry, but you're saying if they do that, you all will also put them on the right path. So that's really important. Um, uh, let's see. And so emailing is the best when it comes to next year. That means putting in appointments and doing it virtually or by phone. Um, in case folks don't want to be on camera. And uh, let's see. Valerie, are you here? If you step off a minute. Aja, if you don't know mine, can you go ahead for a quick second, introduce yourself and maybe tell about, you know, some of the best ways that people were able to get in contact with you or while you were working there in the office? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. I'll turn my audio. Okay. We might be okay now. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry, I had some. Oh, my gosh. No, 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 no. We're having technical difficulties on my end, clearly, still. <laughs> but I'm Aja Moore, and I am the current policy um, assistant for Governor Ralph Northam, and I previously was the LA for Senator Louise Lucas, the president pro temp, um, a Portsmouth girl. And if, I'm having audio just flag that for me, guys, but um, I'm going to just keep talking through just in case. But um, so yeah, um, when I was with Senator Lucas, I was with her for almost two years as an LA and two years as an intern. Um, I was with her my junior and senior year of college and um, was thankfully hired once I graduated. Um, and for me, um, we kind of split the roles because I was the LA and then I had a chief of staff on our team who is still there, Jonathan Freeman. And we also have an office manager um, Tanisha Brim. So between the three of us, we Jeremy? would round robin who was handling what. Um, I handled a lot of the scheduling. Um, so for me, the best way to get in touch with our office and to set up any type of meetings was definitely email, like Melena said. Um, it just keeps it very organized for us. Um, it doesn't go off in the flow. I'm able to kind of take notes and keep tabs on um, that type of thing. Um, Hello, so everyone. My name is Valerie Slater, and I'm the executive director of Rise for Youth, and I'm so glad to be here with you. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the experiences that I have had uh, at the General Assembly, at the GA, talking with legislators and working to move legislation through uh, both chambers of our legislature. 
So RISE for You, RISE stands for Reinvest in Supportive Environments. And our work is with young people, for young people, and for communities. We work with and alongside young people and their families and communities to move juvenile justice in a, in a positive way. Um, on a positive path forward towards ensuring that all young people have the opportunity to, to grow, to develop, to be their best selves without fear of justice system involvement and without ruining their lives if there is justice system involvement. And making sure that young folks have an opportunity to be a part of, of, of making the, the laws that are going to be impacting their lives and changing the laws that are harming their lives in so many ways often. So, you know, we uh, work with community to even develop what our legislative agenda is going to look like. And I'll talk just a little bit about our upcoming legislative agenda. We are going to be working in coalition with other partners to um, remove the uh, collection of child support for children who are in DJJ's custody. Once a child has been adjudicated delinquent, I don't know if you all know it or not, but parents are then, or legal guardians are then tasked with paying the state child support for their child who has been taken and incarcerated. And we are working to remove um, that collection of child support from families. We're also going to be working to remove the valid court order exception. Um, so uh, again, just kind of briefly explaining what that is. When a child is um, has gotten into trouble and has some level of court supervision, then there is a valid court order. So there are some things that children do and they're not crimes except for being under the age of 18. Those are called status offenses. It means that because you're 18 years old, you're not, a, because you are not over the age of majority, you're not able to smoke, you're not able to drink. Um, potentially there's curfews. Uh, of course you must go to school so you can't be truant and those kinds of things. And if a child does not abide by those things that I just shared, it's considered a status offense. And so when a child is under a valid court order, um, that means that those status offenses, if a, if a judge determines that they a child has violated one of those status offenses and that they are going to be locked up, then it's because of that valid court order. In Virginia, we accept money from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. One of their stipulations for providing that federal money to uh, states is that you do not lock up children for status offenses. The workaround is called the valid court order exception. It basically says if there is an order of supervision imposed by a court, then if a child violates that court order in any way, if it be they didn't go to school, if it be they didn't do their homework, if it be they didn't obey their parents, then they can be called back into the court and that judge then has the authority to put that child in jail for seven days for violating the court order. And again, that's the workaround for the status offense piece. So we are working to uh, eliminate the valid court order exception. There are over 30 states that have already eliminated it because we just shouldn't be locking children up for things that aren't crimes. You know, it's not a crime to be out past curfew. And while children should not be consuming alcohol, they should not be smoking cigarettes. These still, if it's legal for an adult and the only reason that it's criminal is because of a child's age, then we should not be locking up children for those things. We should be given, giving children the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and not instead demystifying the whole court system and saying, you know what, now you're going to jail for, for basically being a child who is experimenting and doing things perhaps that they shouldn't, but nevertheless that are not criminal. So we want to do away with that. We'll continue to work on um, removing the use of state dollars for um, uh, the, um, SROs in schools. If a locality is going to continue to fund an SRO program, we don't believe that our state dollars should be funding local initiatives to keep police in schools because we actually believe that police do not belong in schools and that children in a learning environment ought not be policed. And so those are some of the pieces of our legislative agenda. And so we have been working very hard talking with partners who are also doing this work, 
but also talking to legislators. First thing you've got to do when you want to push a piece of legislation forward, you've got to find a patron. You've got to find a legislator who is willing to enter that piece, that idea. What is it that you want to do? You want to end the Valley Court order exception? So then there has to be a legislator willing to say, I'm willing to carry that bill. I'm willing to say that this is a piece of legislation that I'm going to champion. And so they would submit it to legislative services who would then draft the bill. And then once that bill uh, gets a bill number, then we are able to continue to our advocacy, talking to other legislators, talking to our patron, giving them uh, fact sheets and data so that they are able to support this bill that they are willing to carry. And that's the work that we do, right? We make sure that community is number one reflected, that they see themselves in the work that we're doing because we have received information from them for that work. And then that they are willing to come and talk to legislators. Now everyone, you're right, it's virtual, right? That they're willing to sign up to speak and then log in at the appropriate time. And even if you don't say anything except, I support House Bill number 123. I support Senate Bill number 456. That's enough to let those legislators know that you are standing in support. And the more folks that we are able to get to either be there to testify, draft a quick email, and you know, Melina, thank you so much for outlining exactly what that looks like, right? You want your name, you want your address so that those legislators know whether or not you're their constituent, and then you're going to let them know what bill you are in support of or what bill that you are opposing. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that different legislators, they know just how strong the support is. And so we want to get hundreds and hundreds of folks that are in support of a particular piece of legislation, that they are willing to send that email, they're willing to be on those calls, you know, on those uh, virtual sessions, they're willing to make those phone calls and leave those voice messages so that the legislators know. And especially when you know where your bill is going, if it's going to be in one of of the committees, right? It could be in courts of justice. It could be in public safety. You want to know who all of the legislators are in that particular committee so that you can then share that information with them. You call them up, let them know who you are. You send that email, let them know who you are, let them know how you stand. And you want to make sure that you've got as many folks, uh, you know, sending information from as many uh, avenues as possible. If you can get hundreds of people emailing, that's great. If you can also get hundreds of people calling, that's even better. But if you can get folks calling, emailing, and testifying, that's the trifecta. And that's a way to just truly let your legislators know that you are serious about this thing. And it isn't just you, it's not just your organization, that the, the folks of Virginia are behind this particular piece of legislation and it is incumbent upon them to then be, be responsive to their constituents and pass or uh, reject a piece of legislation based on the response of the people. And you know, how have we fared? We have been able to successfully uh, advocate alongside our partners to get many things done. We all know that um, we, uh, right now we've got decrim of um, marijuana and that's not exactly where we want to be. We don't want to be where we are right now because what we've unfortunately allowed to happen is a piece of legislation has passed that has created new crimes for children. And that's always appalling. We should never be looking at ways to continue to criminalize further our youngest members of society. And unfortunately, that's what the current decrim bill has done. But we'll continue to push with our partners, um, Marijuana Justice and ACLU and others who are working frontline on this particular bill. We have the Healthy Community Secure Care legislation, which is talking about making sure that we aren't, we are no longer creating large and isolated facilities to um, incarcerate children. If children, unfortunately, are unable to receive uh, rehabilitative services while they're at home, they need to be as close to home as possible. Facilities need to be very small, no more than 30 beds. And all of the rehabilitative dollars have got to be going into the communities where children are coming from because they are not in isolation 
uh, running into issues and troubles, right? They're experiencing traumas and then reacting to those traumas. And sometimes that reaction is what gets them into trouble. And so if we change the environment, we can also change the outcomes for those living in those environments. And so while we have got some things done, we've still got some battles to fight. But if you follow those steps, right, if you are making sure that you are working in coalition, if you are making sure that you have information to share, right? So we are looking at all of the uses of the Valley Court Order exception and compiling reports and data that we're going to be able to give to the legislators. So it's not just going to be us telling them that we shouldn't be doing this. We're going to be able to demonstrate that it's being overused. We're going to be able to demonstrate that there are other states that aren't using it anymore. We're going to be able to demonstrate that the less a child has come into contact with the justice system, the better it increases their likelihood of being successful. So we're going to bring all of this to bear on our advocacy. And that's what it takes, right? You've got to be knowledgeable about the issue. You've got to find a legislator who's willing to carry it. Once that bill is in, you've got to, to prepare and, and arm that legislator with all of the resources that they're going to be, to be able to need to, um, to speak up on their own bill. And then you bring an army with you to support that legislator to get that bill passed. And that's what we've been doing. And we look forward to, please follow us, um, go to our website, uh, riseforyouth.org sign up to get action alert, sign up to get information, but then follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And then that's another way that you'll be able to get involved with the work that we're doing. And you can be a part of that army making good things happen for the children of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I want you to uh, talk really quickly. You've talked about testifying. So we all, we know about the emails, we know about texting, we know about calling. You mentioned testifying. That was something that I witnessed uh, this summer. The calls to say, hey, sign up. What is testifying real quick for folks who are watching? Oh, Valerie, can you hear me? Can she not hear me? Am I muted? Can you all hear me? OK. Oh, we should. Well, OK. Audra, can you hear me? OK. Um, do you know about testifying and what that is? Because you all have had to call people, right? to um, testify on behalf of a bill or something or a piece of legislation. Oh, you can, can you unmute? Okay. Yes, I'm good yes. now. I'm good. Yes. I'm good. Yes. I'm good. Yes. I think I'm having some echoing issues, guys. <laughs> if it gets too bad, I'll just type my responses. Um, so you want to know about testifying in regards to how does that happen or um, Okay, yes, so yeah. when that happens, we will have people that we are constantly in contact with in regards to a particular bill. Um, so, for example, if you're carrying a bill that speaks to a certain advocacy group, usually we are in communication with that particular advocacy, I'm speaking very in blatant terms, but we will communicate with this particular group in regards to the bill. Um, yeah. And if it's when that happens, we will have people that we are constantly in contact with in regards to a particular bill. Um, so it's up to the bill. For example, if you're hearing a bill that speaks to a certain advocacy group, usually we are in communication with that particular advocacy group in certain cases. But if you're working with us on a bill, it'll be for um, you will ask us and they just sign up through the committees. So we always track that bill. Um, to track when it'll be up in committee so we can let them know. And um, that's really it. So we will communicate that with the chairs and the staff of the chairs. So um, speaking for my experience with Senator Lucas, so when she was chairing Ed and Health and still is chairing Ed and Health, but um, last year was her first year with me um, when she was chairing that committee. So we would communicate with her when we had um, a list of people that wanted to testify and we would just run that past the committee people so they could be on a particular list in order, um, and the chair of that committee will call them up one by one um, for those opposed and those against. And they usually get a short amount of time to kind of speak through their talking points just to kind of keep it moving depending on the length of um, the doc that day. So it's really as simple as that. Um, it's really easy to speak for or against a bill. And um, even when there's a lot of people, they just kind of dwindle that time down for how long you have to speak for or against it. And that's really it. I wanna chime in here really hey, quickly. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, um, 
the public gets an opportunity to speak on legislation. When so bills get heard by committees before they go to the full General Assembly to all the lawmakers, they have to make it through a committee of a certain topic. And that's an opportunity for anyone in the public who has something they want to say to speak for or against a bill. Um, and from a reporter's perspective, um, if I'm watching these committees, which I do, and it's what reporters do, we watch the committees to follow certain pieces of legislation that we're interested in that are important. Um, I'm going to keep an eye out for who's testifying for or against something. And it might be the way that I connect with someone. Um, it might be how I get a quote for a story, or I'm, it might be how I find someone who feels personally impacted um, by a piece of legislation. Uh, so it's a really, really important tool um, to have your voice heard, not just by lawmakers, but potentially by a wider audience. Um, so testifying is a really powerful tool, and it doesn't, you know, it, it can be um, people who are with certain advocacy organizations testifying or from certain um, from the governor's office or um, from the administration. Um, but it can also just be anybody who feels impacted by something. Um, so I don't know how different that's going to be when we're looking at a virtual session um, in in an in-person session. you physically go to the meeting. Um, there will be a time when the bill is being heard and the lawmakers will say, line up at the lectern if you want to speak for it and line up at the lectern if you want to speak against it. Um, and so I, I don't know how that process is going to look virtually, um, <laughs> but maybe someone else does. Uh, but, it, but it's a really important tool to participate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because that was something I think totally misses. I would see people testifying. It's like, how do they get to do that? And so I think it's very important for us to know exactly what Mallory said. We have the opportunity and the chance as citizens to literally discuss it in front of the committee about what legislation is up and if we support it and why we don't and why we do. Um, Valerie is going to try to get back up here, but. I also wanted to touch on looking at my notes. You all have said some amazing, like this is like outstanding. Um, is there anything that you feel doesn't work? Has a constituent come in or a lobbyist come in and you like, eh, you know, this just isn't the right approach, Melina? <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, I think I want to clarify oh, something yeah. um, just about communicating with your if you're um, when it comes to supporting and advocating for bills. Um, if you um, something that I think, um, especially with the pandemic and all of um, legislative staff teleworking, um, it helps us um, to get support like and note it. Um, if we do one email, like if we receive one email that maybe is from an example would be um, there was a little bit a little while ago, um, a lot of the teachers from Prince William were really concerned um, about this hybrid plan for certain students to go back. Um, and it was kind of when it was early November when it seemed like there were cases kind of spiking and teachers have absolutely every right to be concerned about their own health. Um, and um, so we got, I think, like 800 emails um, from teachers around Prince William, Fairfax, Loudoun County, and Arlington and Alexandria. Um, and something that it just becomes a little bit, and I don't want to discourage reaching out, but I just want to encourage reaching out in a more, sol like, with more solidarity, um, something that is just as effective um, is an email that has like, you know, those 800 signatures in just one email um, because we still see that. And it also helps just in, um, maybe it's just my Wi-Fi, but helps not uh, sort of like freeze our emails or anything. 
um, and become overwhelming. I'm sort of a workaholic, so I get like all of the emails on my phone. Um, so I know my phone froze when I was getting the surge of 800 emails. Um, so I like couldn't answer, but like my phone would ring and I couldn't answer it because it was still getting. Um, so I like to encourage um, if you're part of an advocacy group, so that was from like the education associations. Um, I like to encourage just kind of more petition style um, and also just making sure you have the address and all, like with teachers, it was a bit confusing because some would leave their home address and some would leave their school address. Um, so for something like that, where it's maybe you, I am sticking on the teacher thing because it's the easiest thing to think of right now. But if you're a teacher, you know, I live, if you live in Fairfax County, but you teach in Prince William or city of Alexandria, um, just making sure you clarify that um, because we are, especially right now, we're still on high priority for our constituents. Um, just making sure that, oh, you know, they put their home address or they put their school address, but they actually live in my district. And then you also have, um, you know, the aide from this office can reach out to another aide and be like, hey, just wanted to flag this, that we've got a teacher that's at this school in your district, um, et cetera. And I hope that if anyone wants more clarification on kind of best way to reach out, let me know. But I hope that answered your question, Jewel. That's just the one thing, just in an, at a time where we're teleworking so much and email is the best way, I just encourage more petition style. 800 signatures, 800 voices, is still gonna be 800 voices, whether it's in 800 right. emails or one email. Well, we purposely do that to get on your nerves. We wait, Malena, to the end of the day, right? Because we know we wait around 4.15 and you get those Bing, 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 from the service because um, wonderful organizations have contacted their networks and say, hey, let's bring them up. <laughs> that so is easier. I will say, like, sometimes just in, I know this is not going to be like, but just coming from like sending replies to emails, sometimes the action network and the things that you just automatically put your name into, so like some things that you just plug, it's kind of like, Sometimes you'll press reply and it's going to like a general email. It'll go to like info at, you know, Virginia educators. So you know that it's unfortunately not going back to the individual person right. where you're able to reply to, you know, the Virginia Education Association. They'll be able to properly distribute that to their members. Right. And you all do try to reply, honestly. We um, do. And it's just, it's sometimes it's, especially with the pandemic, it's just been like case, so much casework. And it's just, we've got so many folks that need help with unemployment, the DMV, um, even just like connecting with like state legislative liaison, like that's kind of just been such a priority that, so I mean, I replied to an email today that was from two months ago, that was someone um, just asking about, uh, they asked about something that was like a very general subject and it, it had no high priority, um, not that, just to clarify, everything is high priority, but it was just, it wasn't casework and that was two months ago, we were just getting slammed and slammed and slammed with um, VEC. So that kind of was just, if it doesn't have VEC, we're just gonna reply later, reply later. Okay. Um, so the casework for right now, especially, you know, certain things are time constraints like unemployment checks, um, DMV, you know, my license is about to expire, et cetera. We do read everything. It's just the replying thing. Feel free to follow up on emails. We right. work for you. Right, right, right. Well, look, we're at 354. We had two questions. I'll go ahead and read those questions, though, because they're um, very solid questions. I think if they are more in Valerie's lane. Uh, let's see. We had a question about eligibility for parole for juvenile offenders. Vivian Watts sponsored the HB 250 for this session, but is that almost identical to HB 35? Anybody aware of those? Yeah. Mallory, you can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm just, I was just going to say that seems right up Valerie's lane. I'm sure she yeah. I like. I feel like I want to answer some some basic if, if you if you're like looking at that language and you're like, what the heck does this mean? Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to sort of explain maybe some basic information. So the way bills are they're numbered. 
So you're going to bill number 35, bill number 250. Um, and then HB means a house bill. It was introduced by, um, by a delegate in the house. Or SB means a Senate bill. It was introduced by a senator in the Senate. And, um, and in order for bills to become law, they have to pass both chambers. Um, and I, I'm going to... I, I hope that the chat box everyone can see. I'm just going to share the website where you could look up bills. So if someone yes, makes HB 250 and that means nothing to you, because why would that mean anything to you? Right. Um, <laughs> you, you can search for it. And so I'm sharing a link right now. Um, and it's the legislative information set um, system. And it's where the, there's a search box on the left hand side. It's like not the most intuitive, but you can play around with it and you just type in that that bill number and find the language of the bill. Once again, then you got to try to understand it, which is right. not easy, um, but it, it's the it's a good starting resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to share one other link, mm -hmm. which is um, it's not the government website for bills. It's um, a different website that a different organization runs, but I, I find it a little bit easier to use and um, you can kind of explore different topics. Um, and so that's just another website that you can try out and see what you like better. And, and also- Thank you, thank you. go ahead, Melina. Go ahead. Um, I think also Virginia, public access project. Um, I can drop that link as well. That is another great resource. Um, you can subscribe. They have an email that they send out every morning with just um, headlines of kind of, you know, some things are, there were some things about the VEC and some policy changes there. It's just a really good Virginia, where to get your headlines, where to get some articles on different bills that are kind of maybe being brought up um, or just passed. Um, with coronavirus, it's been incredibly helpful in providing several different um, websites for folks to read about um, the new restrictions that like Governor Northam dropped. Um, and it's also just they have, if you're like a huge nerd like me, they have a lot of visuals um, and infographics on things like what does the um, representation in the, G the General Assembly look like compared to 10 years ago? Um, they have a lot of cool stuff on there. I can drop, oh, just kidding, Mallory dropped the link for me. Just another really great resource. Thank you, yeah, I will, I'm telling you right now, the inside scoop, those three links are up on everybody's laptop as soon as they start their day in the General Assembly, no matter who you are in, um, in the General Assembly, whether they're not journalists, activists, legislative aides, those are the sites, especially at LIS. So even I would recommend you all going up there and just playing around with it, um, just, you know, trolling around. If there's an issue, I don't know, climate change, just put in climate change in the search and see what bills were up, what bills will happen to them. We have a question. Aja, would you mind answering this question, please? And it's coming from Bill Rice. And this is a very good question. So Bill says, what do you all think are some ways in which state government or some areas where state government can better address issues in federal government or work in cooperation with the federal government to help achieve policy goals. Let's do the first half of that. Uh, what do you think are some ways in which state government better addresses issues in federal government? That's a good question. Um, and this might be biased since I'm not as federal oriented, um, personally, I feel like we do a decent job in comparison to the federal government, but only because I think when you are in touch with the state that you live in, in our case, Virginia, um, you, you kind of learn quickly how that, not quickly, but you are able to learn a little bit more in detail and a little easier and a little more hands-on with kind of how that works. Um, of course, with anything, there's always ways to improve. and me being a freshman on the executive branch side of things, I feel like that's something that maybe I'll be able to learn within this kind of new realm that I am entering. Um, but personally, I do think that it all comes down to just communication between what your issues are as a constituent and bringing that to your officials in any way, shape or form. And that 
means coming to Milena when you have something in your district, and that means coming to me when you have something that you want to see policy-wise. Um, as a policy assistant, I do not create any policies, um, and I'm still kind of helping out all the different policy analysts in their um, specific areas, but it's easy to kind of contact us to kind of raise those different agendas and just in terms of our own personal research of course we don't work ahead of anyone we work for so in this case i don't work ahead of them or the governor but um i think in terms of just things you would want to see bringing that to us and bringing that to research and then we can bring that to the people that it needs to go to um i know that's a very like general answer because like i said i'm pretty biased by thinking that virginia does a, a good job but we can always do a better job and i think that all comes down to letting us know what you want to see from us as well. We gonna meet myself, Mallory or Malema. Any? Um. So. Ideas on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> frankly, the state government um, is going to do the things that impact that, that you're going to see the most impact um, from in your day to day life, yeah. right? You've got control over uh what what your kids are learning in school um how much their teachers are making and getting paid um what the court system you're most likely to interact with is like um your the roads that you drive on um um health state run health insurance medicaid um what services it covers whether or not it covers dental services um, right. You know who's eligible for that. Mm -hmm. that that's that's all state government, right? Um, whether or not <laughs> marijuana is, is uh, decriminalized or legal, um, once again, it's all state government. Mm -hmm. um, so I think folks would generally be surprised by what the state has power over, right. um, rather than the federal government. But here's the difference: um, the biggest difference, and it's money um congress has all the money <laughs> the state if this is like something that blows people's minds in congress we we take on debt you know we want to we want to cut taxes okay we take on debt um we want to um do stimulus and, checks we want to do stimulus checks we take on debt the state constitutionally can't take on debt we cannot spend more money than we have so it really severely limits what we can do without congress giving us money like stimulus checks or small business loans um and virginia's biggest way to raise taxes the way that we make our most money is an income tax and we our income tax is four and a half percent. That's 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 small. Um, that's not that much. And the highest income tax bracket starts. I want to say like eighteen thousand dollars. Seventeen thousand. It's like very outdated. Right. Okay. So someone who makes one hundred and fifty thousand is taxed at the same rate as someone who makes twenty thousand. Um, and it's a small percentage. And so the state just doesn't have the same amount of money to work with as Congress. And that's the biggest difference. That's oh. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know what? Go ahead, Melinda, did you have something to say? I did, yeah. the dog started barking. Um, but yeah, I completely, that was what I was gonna bring up was money. And just, that's like the hardest part. Um, there's so many bills, especially, you know, there was a new majority this year. Um, and we had a very thorough agenda and big agenda that we were trying to get through. Some bills had been going like constantly rejected for 10 years. Um, and just that is really unfortunately something that just stops some progress or makes some progress rather than a, kind of a bigger, you know, omnibus bill, like just a large bill, it'll break it up into we're doing this part in this year this part will go into effect next year. Um, and that's just the biggest difference, um, I would say. Um, also, we do uh, bipartisanship a little bit better, I think, um, than on the federal level. 
um, especially when you get down to, you know, your local state level, those are really not even supposed to be as partisan as sometimes they can get. Um, and really just the, I think too many, like, we don't talk about enough how much local politics affects everyday lives. Um, I'm from Loudoun County, so if anyone knows Leesburg driving, that's an area that in the past 15 years has gone incredibly, um, it's just boom, 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 boom. Um, in Leesburg though, the roads are super narrow, one windy, some are still dirt roads. Um, and in high school, I went to an area where it was kind of more developed areas and also really rural um, students. So when it would snow, like half of the school would have to like leave early um, because there's like, there was a bridge that would, um, if there were like two inches of snow, it was like that was a very, it was a lethal combination. Um, and so something that's been um, happening with like our County Board of Supervisors over the past five years, I think has just been studies and figuring out how to make the rural roads like less dangerous, whether it's coming up with different, um, whether it's expanding them, taking different routes, like figuring out things like that, which is just not, I always like to say it's not like the sexy stuff, but it's stuff that will make a bigger difference on your life than certain things going on in the federal government. Um, and government is important at every single level. Paying attention to it is incredibly difficult. Paying attention to just local politics, I think can be kind of discouraging because it's just, it's so in the nitty gritty and it's just, oh, I don't know, you know, I don't know, transportation for, is something for me that I'm still working on. And that's at the state level, it's like, there's a billion things going on. Um, and especially like, I'm trying to learn more about the Hampton Roads funding that happened this past session. Um, Cause I do drive, I go on the East Coast sometimes, Eastern Shore sometimes. So I've driven on the Hampton Roads bridge tunnel um, and I've driven on it when it takes like two seconds to get through. And I've take, been on it when it takes four hours and I'm just stuck in a tunnel, kind of just what's going on. Um, so I think something that we do better is make an impact, but that makes it sound like I'm totally, everything's important, but it's some things, the less sexy things also make an impact. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, state is just there. And a lot of times uh, they're in session, what, June, not June, January or February. And if those bills get passed, they become law. When is it? July? Challenge? There's July 1st is like the standard, but some have um, delayed effects till January 1st or July the next year. But standard is July 1st. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they boom, enacted real quick. You guys have been amazing. I would like, however, before we close out for you all to um, give the audience just something that you didn't know until you started working in, with the General Assembly in whatever form of fashion. If we can have Mallory and then Milena, and I want Aja, my homie from Portsmouth, I had to put it out there, Portsmouth homie, to close us out. Something that you didn't know about the General Assembly until you got down there. Oh gosh, like <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning, which it obviously should just, I guess, be obvious to folks, but it just, it blew my mind how good some lawmakers were at the job and how some other lawmakers weren't good at the job. And it doesn't have to do with politics, right? It's not if you're a Republican or Democrat. They're just people who, who know the process and people who don't. And um I mean, that's the way it is with anything in life, but I kind of forget that it applies to, to government as well, but it definitely does. She is absolutely right. Because when I first got in, I was calling Jess, like, I, how do these people know everything? And you said they don't. So, all right, Melissa. <laughs> um, they will never admit that they don't. Right. Um, something I, I mean, I learned so much and really just, um, I think how much these, bills like really like Senator McPike who I work for he really listens to his constituents and he has he's born and raised in his county and so he really has a network of folks that he has grown up with that are able to bring issues to him um he is also a volunteer firefighter 
and he volunteered in several different capacities when he was a kid. So he just has like so many people that rely on him to like do good. But he also, I think something I learned is just how many bills actually come from pe problems that people think are like too little to kind of bring up. Um, there have been bills that have come from conversations that he's had just with friends um, who live in the area. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, you know, this happened at my kid's school and we tried to fight it or, you know, something like that. And just how he's like, no, we can change that. Um, something that I'm thinking about is so he try, he um, has brought bills forward to reduce the amount of SOLs that elementary school kids take um, due to the mental health impact that it has on them. So many standardized tests at a young age. Um, and that's something that you just kind of don't really, it's something that students will just be, you won't really notice it. Like if you're taking an SOL one year, you're like, I had 10 this year. You're not gonna know that the class behind you actually took, you know, several less than you did that year. And it's just, I guess how many things get taken care of, but we just never know about them and how easily it is to bring up an issue and for it to be taken care of, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolute sense. Thank you, Melina. And Aja, what was something that was like, what is this? <laughs> um, well, honestly, I did not know essentially anything about state government in terms of how it really, really works. Um, I kind of grew up trying to learn federal well and was always involved locally. So state was something that I knew was important in there but never really had an in-depth um, education on. Um, so I was really lucky to work for Senator Lucas, who is one of the longest serving members and has taught me so much in such a short amount of time and still continues to teach me. Um, and I would say my takeaway from working with her and now transitioning into the executive would be um, just how diverse and different Virginia is and how the priorities really are so different from all around the state. Um, it seems discouraging when something from your area doesn't get passed because it feels like other areas don't care about it, but it's not that. It's just they have constituents to tend to that have completely different issues than you do. So um, I would say that was something eye-opening to see, um, just the different priorities throughout the state and how different they really, really are and how, how much work it takes to really come together to pass certain things um, that are very area specific to you. Um, and with that would be just the policy process as a whole. I think a lot of people that don't know much about policy or politics think this is just something easy that your legislator can just take care of and that's just that. And it's just not that easy. They put in a lot of work to try to make the lives better for everyone and especially their constituents, but just everyone in the Commonwealth. Um, so I think it's just important to kind of give grace to those legislators that really do um, put in a lot of time and effort to just get anything done. And for those that get a lot done, it's not easy whatsoever because it's not just them. They have right. a whole lot of people to work with and a whole lot of people to communicate and learn from themselves. Um, so reach out to them, but also give them some grace and be very honest and upfront with what you want because they will try. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to each and every one of you for showing up. To Miss Valerie Slater, who I think she has something else to run off to, but Rise for Youth is a amazing organization. It is an organization that we partnered with earlier this year uh, for our annual MLK Day, which brings me into this plug. The purpose that these wonderful people came out today is because this is our pre-launch. We are going to, again, hold our annual Brown Virginia MLK Day of Action, but it will be virtual. It will be on this site. And we wanted you to be, you know, in advance to have the ideas and, you know, of who does what and what does who. So when they come out for us on January 18th, you'll have your questions and you'll know uh if you know delegate bagby is this and then you'll have senator so and so and we just wanted you all to have the you know the scoop of how this stuff works 
this thing called politics that unfortunately involves us, whether we want it to or not. So again, to Miss, to I'm sorry, Miss, I'm giving up. So I was late. To Mallory, no pain. Thank you so so much. You are such a valuable um individual to our community and for sitting there and just spreading information. One thing about Brown, Virginia, we are very big advocates of education, and so we just love our journeys. I have Malina Yanos, who is an amazing, amazing uh, woman. To have someone like uh, Melina in the office is a plus, because not everybody has a staff. Well, I'm not going to diss on the staff, but I'm just saying it is a plus. I love that she said, hey, if you call with something that we can't do anything, we'll show you in the right direction. To Aja Moore, thank you so much, Aja. Aja has been working, working, working. She is in there. Um, oh, Aja got a fan, baby. In the chat, she is now the assist, uh, what policy assistant to Governor Northam. That's a big step up. Very smart young lady. And I am so, um, I guess, not pleased, but just confident to know that we have people like Aja and Melina and Mallory out here and Valerie Slater who are advocating for us and making sure that the citizens of Virginia are getting the education and information that we deserve to have. To Jasper Hendricks, our um, IT guy for today <laughs> and founder of Brown Virginia, and to you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The video is on our website. We had it on Facebook Live, it's on YouTube. If someone missed it, send it to them. And please be on the lookout for more information for our Brown Virginia MLK Day of Action to be held January 18th right here on this platform. Thank you to you all and have a blessed, blessed day.